Historians, I think, are storytellers at the heart of what they do. And I'm going to be telling you a story tonight. I'm going to be telling you several stories tonight. It'll be a little bit different from most historical stories, though, because, well, Professor John Gaddis of Yale University wrote a book a few years ago called The Landscape of History. And in it, he said, historians deal with process and structure. What they often look at is they'll have a relic or some historical event, which is their structure. And they have to then consider and theorize what was the process that created this structure that I have before me. We're going to turn that around tonight. What I'm going to do is, in my story, I'm going to, instead of having a process to look at, I'm going to tell you the structure, or instead of looking at the structure, I'm going to tell you about a process. And then we'll leave it open-ended as to what the structure was that they led to. And later on in the presentation, I'll flip that back on its head, and we'll talk about now that we have this structure created, we'll talk about the process that led to them. It'll be a little bit unusual. Start with my slides. Welcome from MCC, the submarine, and from the uh, LSC 393 crew. This is the World War II seminar, winter of 2015. It is a place of incredible natural beauty. If you've never been, phenomenal. place where our, our nation for over 200 years has culled military officers to serve in peace and in war. It is a place of strength and quiet reverence and seemingly carved from the very granite upon which it is built. This is my West Point. This is my alma mater. And tonight, we're going to talk about those particular leaders that served during war in World War II, West Point at war. And I'm going to highlight six particular persons that we're going to talk about and highlight. I am a graduate of the Academy from 1976. And in the Summer of 1972, I entered West Point for the first time. I was 18, and I was clueless. <laughs> my father had gone to the academy before me, class of 1939. My two older brothers wanted nothing to do with it, so my parents were ecstatic when I declared that I was interested in going and actually got accepted. And I asked Dad, Dad, what's it going to be like? He just smiled. He said, son, you're simply going to have to experience it. And it's true. Dad was right. There is nothing that I can say or show you that will fully describe to you what the experience is. But West Point, as a military college and building combat leaders, likes to say that the stress and the pressure and the tension that they inflict on their graduates, on their students, prepares them better for the decision making that will be oh so difficult in their future lives. My first year at the academy, my plebe year, plebe comes from the Latin word plebeian, meaning the lowest of the low. And I can assure you the upperclassmen left no opportunity to ensure that I felt the lowest of the low throughout my life. During that first year as a plebe, the things that all plebes dream of is to make it from the 2nd of July when I reported in until about the 2nd of June the following year. Because during that time, you will be treated as the lowest of the low. You run everywhere you go. You're not allowed to look around. You're not allowed to speak in public. You must slam yourself up against walls when upperclassmen come through the hallways. It's an experience. But we dream of that 2nd of June when we will be recognized. And recognition means that
They come and they shake your hand and they say, congratulations, you are now one of us. And you may now act like a normal human being. So we dream of that all through the long months. It was right about this time in my plebe year, February, March, when the gray buildings were flanked by gray skies and there were ice flows in the Hudson River that were also gray. They flowed upstream, and when the tide flowed, it flowed downstream. We like to say that they flowed both directions because West Point both blew and sucked. But <laughs> notwithstanding, it was a gray period, and we called it gloom period. And oh, I was so gloomy. I was so gloomy. When I got a note saying that I needed to report to an upperclassman's room after supper that evening, there was nothing to think about. It was simply yet another hell coming my way. And I reported to the upperclassman's room. And he welcomed me in. And he said, relax, Cadet Janowski. I understand you went to Cornwall Central High School, Cornwall, New York, about six miles away. It could have been on the moon for all it meant to me. I said, yes, sir. I did go to Cornwall Central. He said, hey, relax, the sir. I went there, too. And we shared discussions about our English teacher, Mrs. DePriest, <clears throat> and Mr. Bounton. He said, great, great. What the, did you play a sport there? And I said, yes, I did. He said, so did I. Played soccer, and we talked about Coach Reeb. And he said, I know recognition is still months away. But there is a tradition on a case-by-case -case basis that an upperclassman like myself can recognize you early. And being that we're from the same hometown and we share so many friends and family, I'd, li I'd like to do that for you tonight. And he extended his hand and he said, my name is Dave. And anytime you need anything, know that I'm, I'm here for you. If you ever need anything, just come and see me. And it was a moment that is as fresh in my memory now as it was then of how wonderful it was to feel like a human being just a little bit again, that an upperclassman was a friend, someone I could depend on, something that, of course, I would learn to know so well in the military, depending on my friends and compatriots. I left the room that night and went back, and recognition came three months later. Dave graduated, went on his way. I never actually met Dave in person again. But I have seen him many times on TV. And I suspect many of you have, too. Because Dave was Dave Petraeus. Yes, that Dave Petraeus. The rubbing of shoulders of the, the unknown with the famous and the mighty is not unusual in West Point history. For all of its huge impact on the American psyche, West Point is actually a very small and intimate college. At any one time, we only number 4,000 students. And so we meet one another. We see one another. We know one another. And that has been the case in West Point history throughout its over 200 years. Many of us know the history of members of the Civil War classes of the 1840s who knew one another as young men at West Point from all parts of the country. Little did they know that their lives would be split apart with the combat that would come only a few years later, shattering their comradeship and splitting them between North and South. And yet even then, there was a relationship among these men that transcended the battlefield. George McClellan, class of 1842, was a classmate of A.P. Hill. In fact, they knew each other so well because they dated the same girl. Yes. George got the girl. When Miss Marcy chose George, A.P. was quite put out. And years later, Whenever, George, whenever A. P. Hill went into battle, he put on a red shirt. His men said, General, why are you putting on that red shirt? He 
says, damn it, I got this red shirt on so the George sees I'm out here and I'm still mad. <laughs> we recognize Ulysses S. Grant, and perhaps you recognize James Longstreet, Robert E. Lee, second in command, best of friends, best man at Sam Grant's wedding. Friends after the war, too, when, when James Longstreet turned Republican and upset his Southern friends. Perhaps the most poignant pairing, Winfield Scott Hancock, the magnificent Hancock, and Louis Armistead served together as lieutenants in California right after they graduated in 1846, became best of friends. How sad, how cruel that some 20 years later, on the fields of a western Pennsylvania farm town called Gettysburg, Louis Armistead led the charge known as Pickett's Charge against the forces defended by his good friend, Winfield Scott Hancock. Louis Armistead died in that charge, mortally wounded. He lay in the arms of Union officers and said, excuse me, do you know General Scott, or Gen General Hancock? I said, well, of course we do. And Louis Armistead took out his family Bible and his watch and handed them to him and said, would you please give General Hancock my regards and tell him I'm sorry. Hancock handed off the Bible and the watch to his good friend Lewis's wife after the battle, after the war. The only person I haven't mentioned up here, by the way, is uh, you may know Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson was also a classmate of both Hill and uh, McClellan. Uh, kept to himself a lot, but they knew him. And later, in his persistence, he managed to rise from a country bumpkin to 17 in the class of 51. And they knew he was dedicated and hardworking, and he would prove that as well. But I'm digressing from our subject tonight. West Point, a place of history, creating leaders. How do they do it? It was founded in 1777. George mentioned Kosciusko, one of my countrymen. Uh, was selected by George Washington himself to establish a defensive position on the Hudson River where, incredibly, the mighty Hudson River was diverted from its north-south track to make a full 90 degrees to go, across, uh, go past a granite outcropping on the western point of the land. Once past the outcropping, it turned south again. Now, this was important during the continental years because sailing ships were the ones that were going to threaten splitting the United States up the Hudson River, New England from the rest of the country. George Washington saw this particular point as an ideal location where those sailing ships would have to almost stop dead in the water, change their tack, drag themselves across the wind, and then continue forward again, coming almost to a dead stop. He had Kosciusko go out and survey four different redoubts, three primary redoubts, located here, here, and one up in the hills to blow British ships to bits. And as George mentioned, they put a chain across this narrow part just to slow things down even further. West Point was never challenged by the British. It was too formidable. We like to say, and historians at West Point like to say, that we teach much of the history that our own graduates have have created. It's an awesome statement and one that we can very well support with all of the history that comes from the men and now women that have graduated from West Point. Strategic site in the war for independence and some 20 years later President Thomas Jefferson selected it as the site of the first military academy. Many countries had military academies, as George mentioned, for engineering skills. The country was growing quickly. We were expanding westward at a pace that we came to call manifest destiny. And engineers were needed. And the military would lead that foray into the desert, in, into the deserted lands and the empty spaces of the country 
to create railroads and bridges and roads. Engineering was a necessary thing for the country to grow. And a military academy was a natural source of such engineers. Then, as today, the goal was to commission leaders of character. And that was all encompassed in the motto, duty, honor, country. As I say, several other countries have created military academies across the years. We have English and German and uh, Chinese and Canadian and French, and they are all developing this leadership skill for their countries. So how do they do it? What process do they go through? These men served in war but they had to be prepared for that eventuality. Taking, <laughs> man, taking young people of 18 and turning them into leaders. Almost as if they were all peas in a pod, aren't they? Cogs in a wheel, none different from the next. The routine that was developed was primarily set up by this man. He was one of our earliest and greatest superintendents. This is Sylvanius Thayer. He came to the academy in the late 18-teens, I believe 1818 was his first year, and he established a number of routines that are still followed today. He established the fourth class system, that is the plebe system, where they would come in and go through horrendous adventures during their first year. This is our day. This is the first day you come in. You come in, they shave you bald, and then they dress you up like this, and you march around for several hours as you process into the academy. Learn how to, how to stand straight, learn how to march, learn how to say yes sir, no sir, salute, and everything. And amazingly enough, by the end of that first day, they look like this. The process works quickly when you're under such duress. For the remainder of the year, Sylvanius Thayer said they will take academics and they will be strenuous, as strenuous mentally as the R day was physically and emotionally. He established classes where classes were anywhere between 12 and 18 students to a single instructor. And every night you had to do your homework because the first thing that happened when you walked in the classroom was not, well, here's what we're going to learn today. No, the command was take boards and everyone stood and turned an about face. You had your own board, and you started doing the problems you did for homework last night. And then, be prepared to explain it. In my first year at the academy, I had an hour and a half of math six days a week. I earned two college credits in one year. If you don't like math, don't go to West Point. Next slide, come on. Life is rigorous. Beginning with the first year as a plebe, that's how we sat at the tables, by the way. Not allowed to lean back, sit perfectly straight. You had to eat square meals. You had to serve, serve beverages to the upperclassmen. But life continued rigorous throughout despite that. There were parades constantly. We had boxing and gymnastics and swimming and wrestling as required. That's how I got this. Broke my nose as a plebe, but went up against a five foot five lacrosse player from, from Long Island. We had constant formations, moving to supper, moving to class, always flooding the area with other young men like ourselves, extracurriculars, repelling, the studying was incessant, and it certainly frazzled the best of us. <laughs> this is a typical schedule of a West Pointer's day. Now notice the formation begins at 655, but as a fourth classman, that is as a freshman, you're probably up between 515 and 530. 
because you have to deliver newspapers to the upperclassmen. You have to go out and make sure you know what the menu is. You have to announce the hours and the minutes until the next formation. You have to make sure that the upperclassmen are all prepared. You need to then get out to formation yourself in full uniform and then march to class. You have classes through the day. You end in mid to late afternoon, and you immediately go into intramurals. This is not voluntary. Everybody does intramurals. Every cadet, an athlete, is the saying. And every cadet gets out for intramurals. You do that until supper time. You march to supper, and then you go into evening studies. And if you still have energy, you go to extracurricular activities. You then go until taps at 11.30 and hopefully go to bed. I made the mistake of staying up late my first three years, and my grades plummeted until a classmate told me, just go to bed. And that caused my grades to go up. I've tried to pass that on to my son at GBSU. He doesn't believe me. Nevertheless, the days are full. And so they all come out, and you think, OK, they must be all alike, just like a rifled bullet will come out of the same barrel, and you can match them up on CSI so you know they came from the same. Well, surely, cadets must be the same, you think. Well, of course not. We are all different. We all become our own person. It's almost as if the restriction of that first year causes us all to explode in our personality when the restriction is laid off. And that continues long, believe me, long after, uh, after West Point. Clubs, sports. Rising up in the ranks, participating in activities both intramural and extracurricular and inter, uh, intramural, intramural and intercollegiate. All of these are the experience of West Point. It is, as my father said, it will be the longest 25 hours of every day you spend. <laughs> yeah. Duty, honor, country. How do you recognize that in someone? How do you recognize duty or honor or country? I tried to put it into traits that perhaps are more discernible. Tenacity, the refusal to give in, to give up, to let loose. Innovation, if you can't go through it, go around it, or go under it, or go over it, but find a way. Keep cool. If you lose your cool, you're already lost. In the individuals that I want to talk about tonight, they represent and they personify these characteristics, duty, honor, country, tenacity, innovation, and cool under pressure. These were men who became large and legend of our country, large in their time, larger after, men whom we may recognize instantly, others maybe not so quick, but all made their mark. And it all began at West Point. Let's start with our first individual. This strapping youngster came from a military family. His father, in fact, was a Civil War hero his father won the Medal of Honor at the Battle of Chattanooga. He climbed the heights of Lookout Mountain as a young 20-year-old and won the Medal of Honor, stayed in the military for his life, ended up as a, I think, a two- or three-star general in charge of the Philippines around the turn of the century. Right about that same time, his son applied to and got into the military academy. Despite his rather proud standing, he was not unknown to do some hijinks. And in fact, one of the legends at the academy was that one morning, the Reveille cannon was found missing. Now, the Reveille cannon probably weighs somewhere in the vicinity of 600 pounds. But it was gone. Disappeared from Trophy Point. They couldn't find it. Well, I shouldn't say couldn't. They eventually did. It was all the way on the other side of the parade field in the top of the clock tower. And there it sat, up about 50 feet on top of the clock tower. It had happened overnight. Now, there's no proof, but the legend is that this cadet 
was the mastermind behind it. It took the post engineers a week to get the doggone thing down. But some innovative, tenacious, and cool under pressure cadets managed it in a single night. A dozen years later, he was a one-star general in France during World War I, decorated several times for bravery under fire. Here, General Pershing himself is pinning a medal on his chest. And after the war, as one of the most famous generals to come out of the war, he was the Army Chief of Staff in the 1920s. We should recognize him by now, I would imagine. This is Douglas MacArthur, class of 1903. Tenacious, innovative, cool under pressure. During the war in the Pacific, he was put in charge of the US Army forces in the Pacific with his base in Manila, Philippines. He was the senior Army general at that time with some almost 40 years, 40 years of service. Of course, the Japanese steamrolled him out of the Philippines. Uh, he fell back to Pearl Harbor and established a new innovative process of jumping from island to island, the uh, famous island hopping technique, in which he would leapfrog past Japanese strong points, leaving them isolated to wither on the vine because he cut their logistics out from behind them. He helped set the stage for the Japanese surrender in 1945. Here he is returning to the Philippines as he had promised. And in perhaps his most challenging demand, he was put in charge of changing the Japanese government from a feudal society in which they believed the emperor was divine into the democracy it is today. As military viceroy of Japan, Douglas MacArthur did that and achieved a lasting friend for the United States in the Pacific. A few years after this, he was faced with yet another challenge which he created the most innovative response imaginable. As Communist forces from North Korea flooded across the border in the summer of 1950 and drove US and South Korean forces into a tight perimeter of Pusan. It looked like it was going to be another Dunkirk. It looked as if the military was going to be wiped off the face of, of the Korean Peninsula. Douglas MacArthur came up with an innovation that is still taught today at service academies around the world. He took a force and made an amphibious landing at Incheon behind the North Korean forces and threw the North Korean forces into a tizzy, completely driving them back into the north. An amazing maneuver. Our next candidate for discussion, also from a military family, a few years after MacArthur, this young man entered the academy in 1904 as a plebe. He came from California, but his family originated in Virginia, where several of his uncles and great uncles had served the Confederacy. But he was a true military man. He wasn't much on academics, but a great athlete and an imposing figure wherever he went on the academy grounds. He became cadet adjutant for the, cadet, for the Corps of Cadets. And as an athlete, a few years after his graduation, he even competed in the Oslo Olympics in 1912, the Stockholm Olympics in 1912, in the decathlon. Shortly after that, he served in World War I and became absolutely fascinated with a new technology that had just been devised and demonstrated on the battlefields of France. He became the foremost proponent in the US Army for tank warfare, a proponency he would shine to incredible heights in World War II as George Patton, class of 1909. His tenacity, his innovation, his coolness under fire is legendary, and we've all probably seen the movie. The amazing things he was able to do first charged with reinvigorating the American army in Africa when they had defeated, been defeated in a crushing defeat against Rommel at the Battle of Kazarine Pass. He came in, picked them up off the ground, brushed them off, 
got them to stand straight and fight, and they won. He was a terror to the enemy, so much so that as the American forces and the Allied forces were preparing Normandy in 1944, he was actually used as a decoy. He was placed in charge of a fictitious army with inflatable tanks, just so the Germans would keep an eye on him and not see what was coming from the other direction. Now, George didn't particularly care to be a decoy, and his chance soon came after the Normandy invasion when he was put in command of the Third, of the third Army, which became the spearhead of Operation Cobra and the breakout from the Normandy beachhead, a drive across France and into the homeland of Germany. Partway through in December of 1944, the Germans pulled a surprise attack here as they tried to drive forward and capture Antwerp, the Battle of the Bulge. George Patton, as no one else could, stopped his entire army on a dime, made a complete 90 degree turn, and within a few days drove in and relieved the Bastogne uh, contingent of the 101st and saved them from decimation by the Germans. It broke the back of the German drive and Patton continued on into Germany itself. Amazing. Determination, tenacity, innovation, coolness under fire. Our next two, two people are in this photograph. You might be able to pick them out if you look real closely, or maybe not. This was taken in the fall of 1911. This is the freshman football squad at West Point. And among that group up there are two people that would rise higher than anyone else from the class of 1915, commonly called the class the stars fell on. From that class, 37%, over one out of every three members, became general officers. Two of them are in this picture. Let's focus in a little bit. Anybody recognize them yet? Yes, sir. Hot dog. Eisenhower on the left, Bradley on the right. As young men on the football squad in 1911, long, long before Normandy. Let's talk about Bradley first. Hailing from Missouri, he had an arm that was worthy of consideration as a pro baseball player. Had a batting average of 383 for the cadets in his varsity year but he loved the military. And although he served all four years on the baseball team, he did join the Army, of course, at the end of his tour. And interestingly enough, on his yearbook page, I don't know if you can read this, but the last line says, his most prominent characteristic is getting there, tenacity. And if he keeps up the clip he started, some of us someday will be bragging to our grandchildren Sure, General Bradley was a classmate of mine. How about that? Omar Bradley, class of 1915. Four stars now, ultimately became five stars. One of only five that we've had in our history. Patton may have been the spearhead, but Bradley was the one holding the spear. He was the commander of 12th Army Group, which included Patton and others in the drive across northern France into the heartland of Germany. You, sir, have already identified the other man. Dwight Eisenhower, also class of 1915, perhaps rose higher than any of the rest, not only five stars, but in fact, President of the United States. A football player, when he first arrived at West Point, injured his knee sometime around his second or third year, could never play halfback again, but went on to graduate, marry his sweetheart, and command the forces at Normandy. An incredibly awesome and politically sensitive command, 
in which an American would command British, French, and Canadian troops in the assault on Fortress Europe against the Germans. He hoped for success, but he prepared for defeat. But success it was to be. And this man was on the beach. This is a face you may not recognize. His name is Norm Coda, class of 1917. He was on the football squad with both Bradley and Eisenhower. But by 1944, he was a one-star assistant division commander of the 24th Infantry Division out of Pennsylvania. And when they landed on the beaches, it was all hell was breaking loose. Famously, he said something to the effect, gentlemen, we are all getting killed on this beach. Let's go inland and get killed. Hollywood picked up on that line, and they altered it a bit. In fact, the word is that the line that was actually spoken by Robert Mitchum portraying General Coda was, only two people are staying on this beach, the dead and those who are going to die. It was actually attributed to General Coda, but it was actually spoken by a colonel under Coda's command. Nevertheless, Coda was immortalized by Robert Mitchum, that was him, class of 1917. The last of our six is one that didn't serve on the battlefield, per se. He was an engineer, as you can see by his epaulets. He didn't fight in combat, and yet the contributions he made to the United States military during his time during World War II may have affected the outcome of the war and our world perhaps even greater than any of the others, which is quite an awesome thing to say, considering who we've just been talking about. General Groves, as Colonel Groves, from 1940 to 1942, was in charge of a building construction project in the Washington, D.C. area. He was assigned to build the largest office building in the world. And, and Colonel Groves did it well, assembling thousands of workers and building this massive building, completing it on time, ahead of schedule, and under budget, and in the process, creating one of the most recognizable buildings in the world, the Pentagon. Now a general officer, General Groves was reassigned to a new assignment out west. He was going to head out and lead up a smaller group under quite different circumstances. He was headed to New, Me New Mexico, where he'd worked with some egghead scientists. I love this guy. Look at that forehead. And they were working on a project that would create something that would change us all forever, a weapon like none that we had ever seen before. General Groves was responsible for the administration and logistic of the Manhattan Project, which he successfully did uh, and brought to fruition with the dropping of the two bombs on Japan at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Groves. Groves in a rifle barrel. Not so. These men were all very different, and yet they all carried the same duty honor, country, tenacity, innovation, coolness, <laughs> brain cramp, coolness. Did they know each other? Well, yes, they did. And we've already pointed out some of those. Here's an interesting picture from 1931. As the chief of staff of the Army, General MacArthur has been directed by President Hoover to dispatch a number of veterans who had converged on the country in the midst of the Depression to demand money that they were promised at veterans of World War I. At his side is his aide, Major Eisenhower. Eisenhower was the aide to MacArthur in those days. 
Now, if you've ever read anything about MacArthur, you know that he was something of a martinet. Uh, a book will, written by William Manchester termed him the American Caesar. He was almost a man apart from all the normal people. You can only imagine, and I love the look on his face in this picture, how MacArthur must have felt some 15 years later as he sat side by side with his former aide, now a five-star general, both of them. And look at MacArthur's face. <laughs> it looks like he just bit into a lemon. A few years later, as we know, Eisenhower was tapped to run for president of the United States, which ultimately he, su he was successful in. The word about Eisenhower having been aide to MacArthur was well known. And reporters sought out General MacArthur to get a sound bite on the presidential candidate. MacArthur, in his typical MacArthur way, answered thusly. <laughs> you gotta love it. We've already shown that MacArthur and Bradley had known each other since the fall of 1911 as young men on a football team. But they served together during the war as well. During the time that Eisenhower was the head of the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, trying to massage and work together with such personalities as Montgomery and other Brits, it must have been a great comfort to him to have his good friend Brad over his shoulder on the planning team. Did they know Patton? Well, of course they did. Everybody knew Patton. Patton worked directly for Bradley, and indirectly he worked for Eisenhower. Patton was recognized as a tactical genius, not necessarily politically savvy, but his strengths and his weaknesses were understood and used to their utmost. The movie liked to show Patton and Bradley as kind of bosom buddies sharing uh, BFF stories or whatever. The fact of the matter is it was probably something less than that. Uh, later memoirs indicated that Bradley, although he respected Patton, he knew him to be quite a different personality than the quiet, uh, cerebral Bradley. Worked with him, but they weren't buddies. In this particular picture, you see Bradley sitting with his staff. Everybody is in a generally conservative outfit, except for George, who is in his riding pants, his boots, and his shiny helmet. It was typical of Patton, but strength nonetheless that was to be used and optimized in combat against the Germans. Coda? Yes, General Cota knew Bradley and Eisenhower. They had served together, or they had worked together on football. And after the Battle of Normandy, Cota was formally recognized for his heroism under fire on the Normandy beaches. Now, Cota later fell out of favor, because as the 24th Infantry Division, with he now as the commander, drove across France, and they got si blindsided by the Germans in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, General Cota was highly critical of plans that were being given him to counter the German attack. The 24th lost severely in the Battle of the Bulge, losing a high percentage of, of casualties, and General Cota was generally identified as having made several mistakes in that regard. His career never rose any higher than it had been on the sands of Normandy. And here, once again, you can kind of read the face of Eisenhower and wonder what he's thinking of his old football buddy. Six men representing some of the finest high profile heroes that came out of West Point. Duty, honor, country. Tenacity, innovation, coolness. What lesson can we really glean from just these six biographies? 
Well, here is where I would take Gaddis process and structure and kind of flip it over. If we allow that we've built kind of a Jenga tower of structure, that they all have the common denominator of West Point, we can kind of look at the structure, the, the process of West Point as having perhaps contributed in some way to who they were and who they became and what they did for the country. I would draw as a metaphor this picture by Georges Seurat, picnic, uh, uh, picnic in the Park. It's a masterpiece of pointillism, which is an art form in which there are no brush strokes. Every image, if you focus in on it, is actually a series of dots, some of them bright and vibrant, others more dull and background. These men might re represent the thousands of West Pointers that served in the war, all representing their own dot and comprising the force that helped defeat Hitler. They were not, of course, the only West Pointers that fought in the war. If we take a quick look of the years, starting with, with MacArthur's as a base and moving up to the latest possible year that a West Pointer could have served in the war, we look at the enrollments for each year, subtract the attrition rate that was traditional, we can total up approximately 32,000 West Point officers served in the war. All told, this represented about 2% of all of the officers that served. I'm not going to make a case that West Point won the war. That would be foolish, to say the very least. West Point, however, likes to make the case, rightly or wrongly, that they did contribute by providing this professionalism, this duty, honor, country, tenacity, innovation, coolness under fire, perhaps as much as any other school. Perhaps that's the fairest thing to say. As much as any school did, they did. And these men represented that. Duty, honor, country. These men carried away from their four years at the academy that credo and that mentality and that mindset. Believe me, I, I still hear, I, I still dream I'm a West Point cadet at times. I'm going to be 61, and I still dream of being an 18-year-old running down those hallways. It was an experience that changes a person molds them, for better or for worse. These men had that. And they are represented at the academy in statues reflecting that image of they are part of the fabric of this institution. Wherever they went, it went. Douglas MacArthur perhaps put it most eloquently. In 1962, only a few years before his death, he returned for a final visit to the academy and he spoke to the Corps of Cadets. He gave a speech that was stirring and in it he said these words, the long gray line has never failed us. Were you to do so, a million ghosts in olive drab, in brown khaki, in blue and gray would rise from their white crosses, thundering Magic words, duty, honor, country. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry, the strange, mournful murmur of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, I come back to West Point. Always there echoes and re-echoes duty, honor, country. West Point, of course, is not the only academy. It is the 
American Army Academy, but we have fine graduates who are coming from other academies, Naval, Air Force, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, and each are providing men and women of strength and character, duty, honor, country, tenacious, innovative, and cool under fire in every one of these academies, all serving this country. With little to ask for but the support that we give them. West Point. For 213 years, it has attracted and provided military officers for the betterment of this country to defend our way of life. It has done so in the past. It continues to do so today and will continue to do so into the future, God willing.